Hello and welcome to week three, part two of EGM 702, Image Enhancement. In this lesson, we will learn about different ways we can enhance images to make them easier to interpret. Why do we want to enhance images? Now please note, I'm not talking about being able to zoom in infinitely on an image with increasing clarity, because that's not something that exists. By enhancement, we normally mean increasing contrast or improving the distribution of color values within an image. Sometimes it's to improve the appearance of the image in order to aid visual interpretation, aid other analysis, or for aesthetic reasons. We might want to make an image look nice for a publication or some other purpose. Image enhancement can be done in a number of different ways, but there are three broad classes that we will touch on in this lesson. Linear, and nonlinear enhancement, local and global enhancements, and filtering. Let's start with a low contrast image. Overall, this image is rather dark. You might be able to pick out some features. Perhaps you can tell that this image shows Port Rush and Port Stewart, for example, but it's hard to get much information out of this image, and doing any sort of mapping or visual interpretation would be difficult. Part of why this is so is because most of the image is very low intensity. I've included a histogram of the pixel values for the image to help us illustrate this. In the histogram, the normalized intensity, that is how bright the pixel appears, is along the x-axis, and the frequency, or how often a particular value appears, is along the y-axis. So this histogram shows a large peak of values around 0.1, then another peak just above that, and very few pixels with values above 0.2. So most of the pixels have a very low intensity, and the image appears very dark. Most of the image is also squished into this range between 10% and 20% of the total possible values, so we would say that the dynamic range of this image is quite small. It doesn't make use of all of the possible values, and as a result, it has a very low contrast. Linear contrast stretching is where we are linearly stretching the original values of our image to a new range. If we think about this in a, as a function, g represents the stretched image, f represents the values in the original image, and g has the form a times f plus b. You might recognize the traditional uh, equation for a line y equals mx plus b. It has the same form here because, again, this is a linear stretch. If we look at this as a graph where we have our original image values on the x-axis, our transformed image values on the y-axis, uh, we can see that the transformation that we're applying to our original image has the form of a line. And how much stretching we do depends on the slope of this line. We can determine our values of A and B depending on the desired minimum and maximum values of T, as well as the values that we want to start with in our image. So this doesn't necessarily have to be the minimum and maximum values in the original image. This could be somewhere in the middle where we then um, set all of the values below this to our lowest value and all of the values above this maximum value that we're choosing uh, to that maximum value. If we look at an example of this for our low contrast image, we see that we've got quite a bit more contrast now. We can see that there's some detail over the ocean. We see lots of the details inland. We see that there are bright spots. There are some dark spots. So we've done a pretty good job uh, stretching the image in this way. And you can see the histogram that shows this. So our original histogram is in gray here, and you can see it's compressed into this very small, narrow range. And when we've done our linear stretch, we are now making use of the full range of possible intensity values in the image. We can also use a piecewise linear function. That is to say, we have segments that have different, va different values of A and B but we want to make sure that they are only ever increasing as the value in F increases, so they're monotonically increasing. If they are decreasing at any point, then we're going to end up flipping the 
relative order of the original pixel values and that's not something we normally want to do. We have a number of different ways that we can choose the minimum and maximum values in the image. Um, we can, for example, use the minimum and maximum values in the image or the maximum and minimum possible values for the type of image it is. In other words, whether it's an 8-bit image, a 16-bit image, and so on. Um, when we're doing this, though, outlier values can throw off the scaling. In the second image here, you see labeled min and max, we have a couple of very bright pixels and a couple of very dark pixels that end up throwing off this transformation and so we don't make a full use of the histogram or full use of the possible values. If we limit ourselves, uh, but if we remove outliers by limiting ourselves to, for example, the 2 and 98th percentile, you can see that we've got a much brighter image that we can see a lot more contrast in. Similarly, we can take the mean value of the uh, original image, add plus or minus two sigma, so two plus or minus two times the standard deviation, which will cover 95% of the images or of the values in the original image, and you can see what the what that looks like here. In addition to linear contrast stretching, we can do something called nonlinear contrast stretching, and as you might guess. This is where we are, our stretched image is not a linear function of f. It is something else. Some different examples that we have could be a logarithmic stretch, where we take uh, b times the log of a times f plus 1. We could also, the reverse of that, we could use an exponential, uh, an exponential contrast stretch, where we have b times e raised to the power of a times f and again minus one. We can also use something called a power law where we have uh, our transformed image is just some constant c multiplied by the original image value raised to a power gamma. And you can see what the transformation functions would look like for different values of gamma here. So as we are increasing gamma, um, starting, well, starting with values of gamma less than one, these are behaving like a logarithmic transformation, so we're, um, we're increasing the darkest values of the image and we're not really changing the brighter values. As we increase gamma, you see that we're starting to do more and more transformation on the brighter values of the image, all the way up to very high levels of gamma, which looks like an exponential function where we're not really changing the darker values of the image at all. In fact, we're mapping them down to zero, and we're mostly looking at what's going on in the brightest parts of the image. So depending on our application, uh, we might use different nonlinear uh, non stretches in order to look at different, um, different features within the image. So we can use these, as I just explained, to enhance the dark regions or suppress the bright regions. Um, again, it depends on what we're trying to do. So what, what this gamma adjustment or this power law uh, contrast stretching might look like is if you see this image here, this is our original low contrast image that I've just um, stretched a little bit so that we can actually see some differences with the gamma stretching. And I'm using here a power, a value of gamma equals 0.5. So gamma is one over two. Um, and you can see that it's uh, brought out, um, it's brought out a lot of the contrast that we don't see in the original image. Um, but it's also kept the areas of the image from being too bright or too dark. Um, so it kind of gets us into the middle there. Another concept that we, should try to discuss is local and global enhancement. So global enhancement is where we take the same function and we apply it to the entire image. So this is not especially ideal when we have very bright or very dark regions within the image. We might want to do something different with those bright or dark areas so that we can sort of bring uh, as much contrast out as possible. So we might use a technique called a local enhancement. 
And here we're using a function that is derived from some neighborhood. It can be around whatever pixel we're using, um, or we can break the image up into smaller pieces and derive our function for each of those different smaller pieces. So one example of this is what's known as adaptive histogram equalization, or AHE. So this is where we are going to equalize or flatten the histogram of the image using different subsets of the image. So if we look at our original image, I think the default setting for most um, implementations of adaptive histogram equalization would take eight by eight blocks of pixels, calculate the histogram over that, flatten the histogram, and then give us the resulting, um, the resulting image. So that's what that looks like here. And you can see that we've done a very good job brightening up some of these darker areas, but we've also very much washed out uh, the statue in the front, which was kind of bright in the original image. And this is because as we've taken smaller pieces of the image around this bright pixels, um, that's, really, uh, that's really enhanced the, the bright areas um, more than maybe we might like. So this can amplify the noise as well. And so we might use a technique called contrast limited adaptive histogram equalization or CLAHE. And the way that that works is, is that we set a value uh, where we clip the histogram. We then evenly distribute those values across the original histogram in order to calculate the new histogram that we're flattening. And what the result of that looks like is here. And so you can see that um, the statue is no longer completely washed out. We can still see lots of details and we can still see a lot of the details in the background as well. So this is a very powerful technique uh, for working with images that have very bright or very dark regions that you want to um, try and bring out some contrast in while not uh, affecting the rest of the image too much. And just to show what that looks like here with our uh, example satellite image. Um, so this is what the histori histogram equalization looks like operating on the entire image. So this is not the adaptive histogram equalization. This is just uh, taking the histogram of the entire image and flattening it out. And you can see what the result looks like here. And as you see, we've got lots of areas where there's very bright, um, the, the pixels are very bright, they've been washed out, it's very difficult to see a lot of the finer detail. Um, the adaptive histogram equalization has done a much better job um, preserving some of the, the local contrast that we're probably more interested in seeing. So again, which sort of, um, which sort of uh, technique you're using is going to depend a lot on your particular applications. The last image te enhancement technique we'll talk about in this lesson is filtering. Filters are a technique that can either help to enhance or smooth image data. They can highlight certain features or they can be used to suppress features. We might use them for things like edge detection, sharpening images, or reducing noise. They can operate in the spatial or the frequency domains. That is, we can use them on the images that we've been looking at or we can first transform those images into a frequency representation and then operate on the image frequencies directly. In these examples, I'm going to stick to the spatial representation, but I can provide some links for further reading about frequency representation of images. The way that a filter normally works is by convolving a kernel, that is, moving it around the image to calculate new values. For each pixel in the output image, we can then calculate the value in the output image using the values that fall within the window or kernel. To see how this works, I have a short example here using a 3x3 three three mean filter. That is, we're going to take a window of 3 pixels by 3 pixels and calculate the mean of the values from the image, and that's the value that goes into the output image. So, we start with our image here. Our kernel looks like this, an array of numbers called weights. As we move the window around our image, each of the pixels within our window gets multiplied by its corresponding weight and then added together. 
For a 3 by 3 mean filter, the weights are all the same, and they are equal to 1 over 9. The 9 coming from the fact that we have 9 pixels in the kernel. So we start with our window centered on the blue pixel here. We multiply each of the values in our window by 1 over 9 and add them together, and we get 16 back. So that goes into the output image here. We can keep doing this to get all of the different values in the new image. Now you might notice that the edges, where we don't get a full window, aren't filled in. Normally, we need to specify what to do here. You'll need to check the particular software package that you're using to see how it handles these edge cases. One common type of filter is what is known as a low-pass or smoothing filter. One example of this is the mean filter that we showed on the previous slide. The term low-pass comes from the fact that sharp features, that is high-frequency changes in the image, are filtered out. Only low-frequency changes are left. You might also hear this referred to as a blur filter because the end result is that the image looks blurry. One of the most common implementations of this is by using something called a Gaussian kernel. A Gaussian kernel takes the shape of a two-dimensional bell curve. If we look at the 3x3 three 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 example here, we see that the largest weight is in the middle of the kernel, and we have a drop-off as we move away from the center. Each of the weights is multiplied by 1 over 16, so that the end result is still an average of all of the pixels that fall within the window. We can have other variations on this as well. If we want to increase the weight on the center, we might use a 2 sigma or 2 standard deviation rather than the 1 sigma or 1 standard deviation version that is shown here. On the left hand side of this slide, I have an example of a satellite image that has a significant amount of noise in it due to some errors in transmission between the satellite and the ground station. As a result, a number of pixels appear brighter or darker than their neighbors, which results in this very noisy salt and pepper pattern. You can especially see this with the line running down the image. By applying a small median filter, we can smooth out and remove a lot of this noise. It's not perfect, but it does help reduce the impact of some of the noisier parts of the image. This does have the effect of removing some of the detail of the image, some of which was real. So by using some of these tools, we need to decide which of the things are more important, whether we want to have an image that is mostly noise free, or whether we want to preserve as much of the original image as possible. To remove the low frequency variation in an image, essentially the color, and just look at the high frequency variation, we use what is called a high pass or sharpening filter. The way that we calculate this is by subtracting the low pass filtered image from the original image, leaving only the high frequency variation. This has the effect of bringing out the sharper edges of the scene. The beaches here really stand out, for example, but the color differences between different surfaces are gone. The water here looks essentially the same color as most of the other parts of the image. This kind of filter can be useful for automatically identifying objects in between two images where the illumination changes dramatically. The shapes and patterns are preserved and will still look fairly similar, even if the color or brightness level changes by a lot. A more extreme application of this kind of filter is using something called an edge filter. And we saw this when we looked at the curvature and the slope of our uh, terrain models last week. The purpose of these kinds of filters is, as you might have thought, to find sharp boundaries or edges in an image. We have two examples here, something called a Sobel filter on the left and a Pruitt filter on the right. These types of edge filters work by approximating the first derivative or the gradient of the image in either the horizontal or vertical directions. If you think back to trigonometry, we can calculate the magnitude of the gradient by adding the square of the x component to the square of the y component and taking the square root. And the result is what we see here. So this is a direct analog to the slope of the image. Anywhere that the filtered image is bright, we have a sharp, well-defined edge in the original image. That is, the gradient is very high. Anywhere that it's dark, we don't have a well-defined edge. 
In a high resolution image, you might be able to use this to help pick out buildings or roads or other human created features, or to find boundaries between different land cover types, not just visually or, by di or digitizing by hand, but also automatically using the computer. In this lesson, we learned how we can use enhancements to help visually interpret images. They can also help reduce noise in images. We learned how we can use contrast stretching to help utilize more of the range of the image. And we learned that things like global enhancements might not always be the best. We might want to uh, work on smaller subsets of the image in order to bring out the contrast in each of those smaller regions. We also learned that filtering can help us reduce or enhance noise or high frequency variation and help us to find edges in the image. I've included a number of different resources here. Uh, you can read more about these different techniques in Lillisand, Kiefer, and Chipman, Chapter 7, as well as uh, Chapter 5.4 of Tempfly et al. There's also a link to the Natural Resources Canada remote sensing tutorials here uh, where you can read more about this. And I've included a few different uh, videos um, from Computerfile and other sources on YouTube that talk about how blurs and filters work, finding the edges in an image using the Sobel operator, and how we can apply contrast stretching in ArcGIS. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting and useful, and if you have any questions, please post them in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.